So normally when I, uh, I, when I answer my rhetorical question, uh, I sometimes use uh, examples from uh, uh, Paul and Charity Water and Sal Khan and Khan Academy. But uh, since when I was putting this together, I saw they were both on the uh, agenda this afternoon. Uh, I figured I, uh, I would turn to um, maybe some news stories. And so I'm incredibly honored uh, to have Nirvan join us um, and talk a little bit um, about the amazing work he's done with uh, uh, Keynes Arcade and the Imagination Foundation. So um, having had the honor of participating in the last few of the Social Innovation Summits, I was uh, looking back on just how fast things have moved. In fact, um, if we uh, uh, a few years ago had um, thought about uh, social media uh, or video, uh, I might have had to convince you that it was just uh, just sustainable. Um, next slide. And now uh, we fast forward to a year uh, 2012 where, from at least YouTube perspective, um, we've just seen amazing growth. And in fact, the uh, most notable uh, transition, I think, over the last few years has been the importance of mobile. Uh, a team that uh, uh, we started back in 2007 uh, now accounts for uh, more than one in four of our uh, playbacks. Thanks. And that's something that's, um, that's only growing. Um, and why is this important? Well, because it's not just a consumption device, but it's also a creation device. And so we think it continues to open up um, the accessibility and ensure that YouTube is not just a global living room, but is a global classroom and a global town square. And so um, I think even just a year ago, though, we might have been discussing, well, that's great, and we're, we're sure YouTube's large. Um, but will people watch anything other than Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber? And uh, again, you know, I didn't have to build a YouTube for students or a YouTube for activists in order to see video um, become an amazing uh, bi-directional communication device. And I think the world has already uh, uh, been, been, it's been proven to the world that uh, without a doubt, uh, a video um, can travel uh, across country borders, across cultural borders, and share information. Um, and so back to my rhetorical question, can video change the world? I mean, obviously the answer is absolutely, but I think the point of today's discussion is to turn that question around and ask everybody in this audience, how are you going to use video to change the world? Um, in my mind, there's three large areas of impact that video has been able to have. And I don't, when I say impact, it, I don't just mean awareness, right? Because very often I'll talk to um, social good, social innovation, nonprofit organizations, and I'll say, well, what do you want to do with video? What are your goals? And they'll just say awareness. And to the best of my knowledge, awareness has you know, never fed a hungry child. Awareness has never uh, cured a, uh, a previously thought to be incurable disease. Um, and awareness has never done something as uh, basic or tactical as paid the, the salaries of your employees. So one of the things that we're really trying to work with the uh, social change segment on is to think very specifically about what do you want that video to accomplish? Are you trying to get dollars donated? Are you trying to get petitions on a signature? And how can we build that into the platform? Uh, one of the areas that I think is uh, clearly uh, most ripe for uh, impact by video is the uh, connections and building community. Hi, my name is Keith Wong. I'm a sign language comedian. I'm a hearing child of deaf parents. I didn't know they were deaf for the first eight years of my life. I thought they were just ignoring me. YouTube has really given me an opportunity to share my stories and my jokes and my style of comedy with the community that I grew up with. This community is the sign language community, the deaf people, the interpreters, the hearing children like myself. My parents have never had access to the TV when I was growing up. So uh, was Keith, there, who wanted to be with us no today, but actually was uh, so invited, invited by the BBC uh, to, uh, to start filming um, some work over there, is uh, uh, the most popular uh, ASL comedian on YouTube. And I think that probably makes him the most popular ASL comedian in the world. Um, it's a, uh, he, he found, his, found his community um, first uploading a video where he uh, parodied the challenges of a sign language uh, interpreter um, trying to translate Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby um, to, to an audience. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, that uh, video became popular. And what he found, though, was that there was a segment of audience that uh, before wasn't being serviced um, by traditional media. Of course, uh, when we, we think about accessibility, we think about, well, how do we take 
the content that's been created for everybody else and make sure that it is uh, available to the hearing impaired. But we don't always think about, well, what's content that can be created um, specifically uh, for them? And so um, Keith uh, now uh, both uh, performs on YouTube as well as tours um, and has really identified that there's a uh, segment of viewer that I don't think your local cable company was thinking about how to reach, or uh, we're, we're never going to get a blue line on the channel guide in your cable box, but now uh, Keith delivers to the world. Um, I want to talk about one other person who has found their community on YouTube. Many ways to say hello. Hi. Hello. Hi there. Hello there. Hey, how are you doing? Howdy, friend. So if you haven't figured it out, Duncan uh, teaches English as a second language. Um, he uh, actually was teaching for a while in rural China and found uh, so much pleasure in uh, teaching language that he realized that um, as large as China's population was, that there was one population that might even be larger, and that's the YouTube community. So when he moved back to the UK, he started uploading videos. He's since made that his full-time job. Um, he recently heard that a member of his viewing community would actually download these videos, put them on videotape, and bring them to uh, a rural school in Africa. Um, and so now he's trying to figure out, well, how can we get to, you know, that, that's great, he supported that, but um, how can we get to a more connected world um, where uh, you don't have to necessarily take something off of YouTube to reach every student, especially those who don't have classrooms. And so why do I um, highlight these two? Um, because I think it's a great quote from Chris Anderson, the curator of TED, about how video makes us smarter. Um, and so the, uh, can video change the world? Yes, it can, it can bring us skills uh, beyond uh, what we thought we could learn before. Uh, this uh, insight of his came actually out of um, uh, his doing his first TED Talk. And he realized, he said, wow, these, these TED Talks that people are giving, they're getting really good. I mean, they are improving at an accelerating pace. Why could that be? And he realized it was because once TED put the archives of all their talks online, everybody got to watch the previous performers and start to understand how to uh, uh, improve their game. And so um, he expanded this into a thesis of uh, rapid iteration, where uh, no longer are you limited to just what you can conceive of or what you have available to you in your local community um, to um, uh, learn something or improve upon it, but you have access to uh, essentially a global film reel. So uh, I think the first thing that video can do clearly is um, you know, expand our notion, teach skills, and allow us to access what is truly a global classroom. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about collective action, but introduce Nirvan to do that. Thanks. Uh, hi, um, my name is Nirvan. And about eight months ago, on April 9th, I posted an 11-minute short film called Kane's Arcade onto YouTube. And within five days, that movie became a movement and within five months, we had implemented two successful programs on a global scale. So I'm going to show a few clips about how that happened and kind of talk through it. Uh, this is the first clip of the short film, Kane's Arcade. My name's Kane. I'm nine years old. My arcade is called Kane's Arcade. It's open on weekends only, and it's really cheap. Kane spent summer vacation coming to work with me. We sell auto parts in East LA. My dad had a lot of boxes back there to cut them up and make my arcade games out of it. My first game I made, the basketball hoop I got at Shady's Pizza. He started from that little game and little by little they started getting fancier and fancier. My next game I built was a soccer game. First of all, I didn't have no goalies. People said it was too easy, so I bought army goalies, and then my blockers. I thought, is it easy now? I met Kane randomly. I had to get a door handle for my 96 Corolla, so I pulled into this used auto parts store, and I just came across this elaborate cardboard arcade. I asked him how much it was to play, and he's like, for one dollar, you get four turns, but for two dollars, you get a fun pass. How many turns do you have a fun pass? You get 500 turns for a fun pass. I got a fun pass. I got tokens, my business cards, and prizes. The first prizes, I used my own toys, like the cars were my own toys. I used to like Hot Wheels when I was little. And I'm playing like miniature soccer, miniature basketball. And then when you'd score a point, he would crawl into the box and he 
pulls out these little tickets out of the side of the cardboard. And I was like, this kid's a genius. So that was just a random, it was actually the last day of summer that I met Kane. When he crawled into the box and pushed out the tickets, I went from running an errand to being transported back to my own childhood and being nine again and really being inspired and remembering why I started making films and creating things in the first place. And I decided I wanted to make a short film that would try to capture that feeling and share it with more people. So I came back two days later, and, and Kane wasn't there. He's back in school. Um, and I met Kane's father, who had seen me on the security camera footage, and I said, hey, can I make a short film about your son's arcade? And he said, actually, it's kind of funny because you've been Kane's first and only customer. So Kane, it turns out, had spent every day of the summer coming to this arcade, building it, improving it, asking everybody who came in to buy an auto part to buy a fun pass, and everybody just kind of walked by him. And that really broke my heart. So I hatched this plan to surprise Kane with lots of customers. And the idea was to have a flash mob and invite everybody in the world to come out and play. So I posted this idea uh, as an invitation on Facebook. And the story spread. A friend shared it. It went viral on Facebook. It was shared by a site called Hidden LA, which had 230,000 fans. An hour after I posted this invite, NBC News was at the auto parts store trying to get an interview with Kane. I also posted it on Reddit, and it hit the front page of Reddit. And all of a sudden, there's tens of thousands of people rooting for Kane and rooting for this flash mob, it was getting really big. So this is a clip of the, the day of the flash mob. The plan is, I'm going to take Kane to Shakey's Pizza. We're going to play some arcade games. We're going to eat lunch. While Nirvan sets up a big surprise party. Kane has no idea what we're doing. And when we get back, he's had the biggest surprise of his life. And the idea is just to get as many people as we can to come out to Kane's arcade and just make his day. Kane's dying to have one customer show up to his arcade. So Kane is to be the most surprised little boy in the whole wide world. Hey, you ready? In about a minute, he's gonna arrive here. Hey, Kane. Can we go home already today? We had no customers today. No. No? Come on. Your dad's tired. No can do. No can do. We're back, Kane. Wow. What's going on over here? <laughs> huh? We finally got some customers here. Okay. So at the end there of the film, I put up this little invitation for people to uh, uh, donate to Kane's scholarship fund. And I set up a, a WordPress site and a, a PayPal button. I said, hey, imagine what this kid could do with an engineering degree. And it was, there was a $25,000 goal. And I thought, maybe in a year, we might get some of that. And, and whatever we get, that's great. That's more than he had before. The first day the film was posted, it got over 1 million views and raised over $60,000 for Kane's scholarship fund. So we raised the goal at $100,000, <laughs> you know, thinking by the time Kane's ready for college, maybe a semester that'll cover. So uh, <laughs> the, the next day, it had raised over $110,000. And at that point, we said, whoa, what's going on here? Do we raise it again? Um, 
we decided, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. This was happening very fast. So we, we thought it best to keep the goal there until we figured out a plan. Meanwhile, Kane's Arcade is trending worldwide on Twitter. Uh, Justin Timberlake calls Kane, you know, on Twitter, like his entrepreneur of the year. He's on Forbes magazine twice. Um, <laughs> and there was just this amazing response. And, but it wasn't just the response from the media. It was the response from kids around the world. So I'm going to roll a little clip of the response that happened. And just so you guys know, when this happens, I, I didn't sleep for two days, right? You're literally trying to read everything, and you're spending an intense amount of time listening and then improvising. So this is what happened in the media. This is a clip from Kane's Arcade 2. Finally tonight, we have a great story out of Los Angeles, East L.A. to be precise. When you're a lonely nine-year-old boy, an empty cardboard box can be a universe of possibility. I found this great story. I want to share it with you. They're lining up to play at his cardboard arcade. This kid made his own arcade. And the Internet has been flooded with response videos. Yeah, I'll get to Jojo Roman, and I made this ball machine. It's called Tilt-A-Ball. Nice! Awesome. Where's my hair? I'm just getting your circle, okay? Okay. So something really magical was happening. Um, you know, five days after the film was posted, it had over five million views, and uh, I was talking to the Goldhurst Foundation. We wanted to try to do something with this and, and help more kids. Um, and he said, you know, you're starting at the destination. What can we do to help? And he put up a, a $250,000 challenge grant matching every dollar going to Kane's scholarship fund and giving us a dollar to start the Imagination Foundation, which will help foster creativity and entrepreneurship in more kids. And at that point, we raised Kane's goal to $250,000, uh, and we've now raised uh, $220,000 of that goal. So here's a little bit of uh, what the Imagination Foundation did in the few months after we got that support from the Goldhurst Foundation. So the Imagination Foundation's mission is to find, foster, and fund creativity and entrepreneurship in kids like Kane. After we started the foundation, the first thing we did is we hit the ground running with a school pilot program. Within the first two months, over 100 schools in nine countries participated using project-based learning to teach kids math, science, and engineering. One of the greatest challenges I think we face in education is tapping into children's natural powers of creativity. And one of the appeals of Kane's Arcade is it's demonstrating how deep those powers are and how readily people will rise to the challenge if you give it to them. So we gave people a challenge. It's called the Global Cardboard Challenge. We invited the world to play, to build anything they wanted using imagination and cardboard. In the three weeks after we posted Kane's Arcade 2 with this invitation, over 270 events in 40 countries were organized around the world. And these events raised tens of thousands of dollars for local causes. I told Kane that when I was a kid, I also built cardboard rockets. These were space capsules that we could actually fly in our backyard. And here I am, many years later, and I'm still building a spacecraft. But this one, a real one, that landed on Mars. Childhood imagination will take you from cardboard to this in just a few years. Global Cardboard Challenge, but this will be an annual event, and basically every October 6th, the one-year anniversary of the flash mob that came out to make Kane's Day, people around the world will have flash mobs to come out and support the creativity of kids in their community. I uh, have a feeling some people are going to want to talk to you once we're done. Yeah, I... I I'd love to talk to you. It's not just the Global Cardboard Challenge. We're thinking more about ways to use storytelling and media to inspire and spark creativity in more kids. We're, we're in development with a lot of, uh, of new programs. So if anybody would like to, like to talk about partnering so on some of the stuff we're when, doing, I'd love to When we first to got in contact, I was incredibly moved by Kane's Arcade, and I uh, uh, 
got in contact with Nirvan and expecting, you know, sort of most of the time people are like, hey, um, yeah, I've got another video coming out and if you guys could tweet it, you know, that would be really cool. And so I'm prepared to sort of say, hey, you know, we're going to we'll promote what you, you want to do. This is great. And, and he tells me, um, you're, you know, really, you want to lend your support? Like, yeah. Well, he's like, okay, well, in 30 days, I've got this global thing going on, and I turned this into a foundation, and uh, I've got some big ideas. So I had to recalibrate uh, what, I was, <laughs> what I was about to do. Um, so clearly, collective action, uh, uh, you know, video is a big step to that. Um, the third area that I want to cover um, is um, perhaps um, a little bit uh, controversial, the notion of global citizenship. So. I, I truly believe that uh, video um, and global media, maybe video in particular, um, gives us a shot at creating the first class of global citizens, people who think about themselves as being part of humanity before they subdivide into any one country, uh, religion, uh, political belief. Um, and uh, I believe we have a shot to do that because of uh, uh, changes in technology platforms. I, I um, much like Kane will, I paid a lot for my history degree um, growing up, so I'm going to give a quick history lesson. So um, the US Postal Service started out as a uh, distance from origin tariff system. So basically what that meant was it, the further you wanted to send something, uh, the more it cost. And of course, this prevented uh, sending, let's say, catalogs or newspapers from New York to Chicago um, because it was just prohibitively expensive. And so um, what you were held to was sort of regional, you know, a regionalizing of culture, regional beliefs, regional information. Um, you couldn't uh, share things. Um, Post-Civil War, it got moved to um, a, a single flat rate. So all of a sudden, it cost the same amount to send something from New York to Philadelphia that it did from New York to Chicago. And what that led to was an explosion in uh, national content. All of a sudden, uh, Sears catalog, these things could now exist. When you think of the internet, uh, the internet, you know, uh, obviously with sort of the caveat of accessibility issues, how can people get online? And, and that's a, 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 a real effort that a lot of people are working hard on. But the internet uh, was designed as a essentially flat rate system, with the exception of uh, you know, maybe latency, uh, often unperceptible to the user. Uh, it doesn't matter where the content started out. Uh, everybody is able to share and experience things together for the first time. Um, before, content stopped at borders. It stopped at borders for technical reasons. It stopped at borders for business reasons. Um, but now, uh, those borders are porous, and YouTube serves as a uh, global, uh, global place to view things. Uh, this really hit me at a personal level. Um, in 2009, uh, during a trip I made to Baghdad, I had a chance to go over with a handful of technology executives um, with the U.S. State Department in what they were calling a technology delegation, the idea of 21st century statecraft, being able to do knowledge exchange, not just uh, you know, guns and butter. And uh, I believe uh, when talking to folks that, uh, that uh, everyone has an agenda, except teenagers. Teenagers will tell you exactly what they think. And teenage girls, even more so. And so the best time I had was actually meeting with the students groups, and I found uh, uh, a teenage girl, and I started talking to her about, about YouTube. And of course, through this entire visit, um, I was a little bit self-conscious about even asking about YouTube, given everything going on and the incredible responsibility these people were taking for um, building up a, a new government, a new society. Um, you know, how could I be so self-serving as to you know, ask, well, you know, what, what have you watched recently? Um, and, but I did. I asked her about YouTube, and she said, my god, it's incredibly important to us. And you know, tell, tell me why. And she gave me two reasons um, that I actually don't think, you know, might not be that different than what a teenager here in Palo Alto might say or a teenager in Tokyo would say, but obviously with incredibly uh, different uh, backgrounds and circumstances. She said, YouTube matters to us here for two reasons. The first is uh, I can see what the rest of the world is watching. That before I had very limited access to content. I felt isolated. Uh, I, I didn't know what a 17-year-old in, in, in Paris was like. Um, and of course, I mean, if you've sort of, in addition to studying history, I studied, uh, 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 you know, sort of philosophy, a good liberal arts education. And if you think about identity theory, it says, you know, if you, if you, uh, things that are distant or people you don't know, you, you think they're different. You think they're different. You think they're scary. Um, and so she was able to now not just look and understand, you know, what it was like to be an Iraqi, but what it was like to be, to be human. 
And so I think about that every time I sort of watch a, uh, a music video or uh, a cat video get popular on YouTube. I think not so much about, oh, 30 seconds of fun or a break from what you know I've been focusing on, but I think about the global dispersity of uh, those people watching that and how diverse that audience is and what, what it means to them. And the second thing she said was, um, I use it to come up with my own version of the truth. Uh, she told me about how previously when something would happen locally, she would only hear rumor or she'd get one point of view, usually a government point of view. But now between uh, open newscasting, uh, between citizen journalism, anybody having a camera in their pocket, she was able to take multiple points of view and uh, incorporate that into her thinking and decide for herself what was true and what wasn't. And I thought what was so interesting there was her word choice, not of I can discover the truth or somebody will tell me the truth, but I can come up with the truth. And I think that's one aspect of YouTube and video that people sometimes ignore. Um, they treat it just as a TV with a really big audience. Um, but it's not. You know, the, it's not just the content, it's, it's, it's the medium. Uh, uh, professor Wesch was, is, is a, a Kansas uh, State professor who has really done a lot of anthropology of YouTube stuff, and he hit on something a few years ago that I think is very true. There's something about the medium, there's something about the way we hold it on a tablet close to us or uh, on a computer screen um, that makes it both simultaneously incredibly personal but also incredibly open. And so what this means in global citizenship, in my opinion, is that YouTube's not just about uh, a bigger megaphone than content creators have had before, but it's about something bi-directional. It's about something where people are able to talk back and become part of something, and as well as talk to each other. Uh, the most amazing thing about, for me, videos like uh, Kony 2012 was not so much that they got to nearly uh, 100 million views, but that there were 40,000 response videos, that people gave their support, gave their disagreement, gave their reaction, and we're talking to one another, talking to their communities. And so when that happens, you get something that's uh, even more powerful than a montage of stock photos. Uh, you get sort of this, this, global, um, this global citizenship. And global citizenship, you know, to me, again, you know, it can be as powerful as uh, my friend in, in Iraq, who when I got back, I did a little bit of research, and uh, um, I've been tracking this number in 2011, uh, you know what country watched most YouTube video per capita internet user? Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, now obviously skewed a little bit by sort of the uh, percentage of the population that's online, but it's higher than you'd think. And um, to me that just, uh, again, is another data point that shows uh, when you uh, take something that was previously scarce and controlled centrally and give people access to content, um, there's a, almost an insatiable appetite. And um, uh, I think the potentially uh, best, or depending upon how many times uh, your uh, teenager has played this song over the last few months, worst example. Open Gangnam Style. I won't ask Steve to horsey dance, but um, so I, I'm sure everybody in this room knows this video, Gangnam Style, um, from Psy, Korean pop star. Um, this was his. Uh, this was also his sixth album. So he's not a uh, single sort of flash in the pan. Where did he come from? Actually popular within Korea. Um, uh, it was decided though that Korean music wasn't popular worldwide. And it was decided because, you know, why would people, why would Americans be interested in Korean music? Um, even before this on YouTube, we've seen incredible growth in uh, content that didn't think it had a global audience. Uh, Gangnam Style uh, is very likely going to be, uh, is now sort of the most viewed video uh, on YouTube of all time in the last few months, and is going to uh, most likely be the first video to hit uh, a billion views unless Justin Bieber uh, uh, gets his gets his uh, his Bieber army excited. Um, so obviously, obviously lighthearted, um, but you know I, I think it's important when I when I look at sort of the power of YouTube. Um, I try not to judge uh, based upon the content. Oh, is this is this high quality? Is this meaningful? Um, the content's meaningful to everybody who watches it, and on YouTube it finds a global audience. And so. I think the responsibility that, uh, that, that I have is not so much to change the world, um, 
but to help the world change itself. Um, and that's going to happen through people uh, in this room. And so um, I'd be remiss if I didn't then plug that uh, at 3 o'clock, uh, or the, the, the next uh, working session, um, uh, myself and some of my colleagues are going to be here for office hours, uh, I think in room number seven. And so if you have particular questions or ideas or want to talk about your strategy for YouTube, um, we'll be able to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with you. So um, thanks so much uh, for the chance to tell you a little bit about uh, my uh, a 30-minute response to a rhetorical question. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see what we're going to talk about next year.